In ancient Greek mythology, the beautiful goddess of dawn, Eos, falls in love with a handsome Trojan prince called Tithonius. But she is an immortal goddess, and he is merely a mortal man. So she begs the mighty Zeus, king of the gods, to give Tithonius immortality so that they can share the whole of eternity together. But Eos had forgotten to ask for eternal youth as well. So Tithonius ages and withers. He ends up bedridden and babbles all day. And eventually, he turns into a grasshopper. So the moral of the story is that lifespan is not enough. What do we need to add to life to make it valuable? Well, at the very least, what we want is health. We don't just want a long lifespan, we want a long health span. So what is health span? Well, let's consider someone who lives to a ripe old age of 95. And that's shown here on the red line. Um, and this plots their health utility index. And health utility index is something that is 100% for if you have perfect health and 0% if you're dead. So what we see here is that by the time this red individual is in their mid-60s and beyond, they, they, they start having pretty poor health. Now let's think of another life, someone who lives slightly shorter, perhaps to the age of 90. But they, the orange life, have very good health, extremely good health, until their mid to late 80s. So what's the better life? Well, health economists have been thinking about this for a while, and they've come up with a measure called the Quality Adjusted Life Years, or the QALY. And what the QALY is is essentially the area under the curve. So the area under the orange curve, under the orange life, is 80 qualies. Not bad. But the longer life, the red life, only has 61. So on this basis, the better life is, in fact, the shorter. So what we've learned from this is that life extension which is an elongation of the longevity curve, is not everything that we want. What we want is a squaring out of the curve. We want health extension. But this brings us to an important question, which is, is a healthy, long life all that we want? We might be bored. We might be tired. We might be miserable. We might lack a sense of meaning and purpose. So what makes a life that's worth living? What makes a good life? What makes life go well? What is the kind of life that you would want to live again and again and again, like in Groundhog Day? Well, we've had two and a half thousand years of philosophical dialogue about this. And there have been a number of theories that have emerged. So let's look at some of them. The first view is that Human well-being is, in fact, constituted by happiness. And this view was proposed by Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, and the ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus. But the question is, what do we mean by happiness? Jeremy Bentham's view was very simple. He thought it was simply pleasure and avoiding pain. But we might think that we need a more nuanced approach Maybe happiness is a positive emotional state, a kind of good mood, a lack of anxiety, a lack of depression. Or yet, we might need to look even wider and think of happiness as life satisfaction, viewing one's life from an overall perspective. Another theory of well-being was proposed by Thomas Hobbes. And that is, his view was that human well-being is the deepest fulfillment of our goals and desires, or rather, the goals and desires that we would come to have if we were fully informed. 
And this view is, in fact, very um, uh, popular amongst contemporary uh, philosophers and um, economists. A third view was proposed by Aristotle two and a half thousand years back. And his idea was that the human good is, in fact, human flourishing. Consider this flower. There are certain objective ingredients that will be conducive to its flourishing. Ample sunlight, fresh water, a fertile soil. These things will help the flower bloom to flourish. And so similarly, Aristotle argued, that there are certain objective factors that are conducive to our flourishing. And for him, the internal factors were particularly important. His view was that human beings have certain human capacities. And when we exercise those capacities well, when we exercise them excellently, like a virtuoso, we have what he called the human virtues. And those were particularly important for flourishing. So let's take a look at what kind of uh, a list we might have on the factors of human flourishing. Well, first we have the virtuous traits, things like self-control, courage, moral wisdom, moral virtue, kindness and compassion, optimism. And then other factors, external factors, which were conducive to our human well-being. So things like having moral and economic autonomy over our lives, having authentic friendships, having loving relationships, plenty of accomplishments, having fulfilling work, having an, a deep understanding of ourselves and the world around us, earning the esteem of others, developing a sense of meaning and purpose in life, and having goals that go beyond our narrow self-interest. So if these factors of flourishing really do constitute a good life, suppose they do, well, then that would lead to a life satisfaction. That would lead to happiness. And since happiness is something that we desire, we would eventually come to desire these factors of flourishing. So what we see in this kind of a schema for the good life is that the good life requires development. It is a virtuous circle. So now we come to the real question of this talk, which is, is a long life a good life? Surely, if we can't live good lives right now, with our current lifespan, why would any more life be at all beneficial? This is a real worry. Well, we might have a small glimmer of an answer of a hope here. Because what we've seen is that good lives require development. They require developing our virtues and mental attributes. They require developing our wisdom and experience. They require developing a sense of meaning and purpose. But if we can develop these things, then more life will allow for more development and so lead to better lives. And as time goes on, we may develop new technologies which will actually enhance our well-being and perhaps create a new state which we might call super well-being. So, so what we've seen is that life extension, super, well, super longevity, is not everything that we want. We don't want to turn into a grasshopper. But it actually is important. Why? It's important because it will allow us to develop good lives. It will allow us to develop super well-being and perhaps even a great life. Thank you.